The Mad Elephant of Mandla by Colonel A. Bloomfield In one of the many disturbances that took place during the troublesome times that prevailed in Berar between 1830 and 1840, a male elephant escaped from his master at Ilijpur and made off in a northerly direction into the jungle and forests that clothe the range of hills that extend thence across the central provinces to the eastern ghats overlooking the Bay of Bengal. He was there a veritable needle in a haystack, and it is not surprising that those who went in search failed to find him. Thence he roamed the forest-clad hills into the Chindwara district in the dominions of the Raja of Nagpur. The Raja sent off detachments of infantry and cavalry to effect his capture. The pursuit was continued for months, every known device being tried to secure him, until at last the elephant leaving the Chindwara hills passed south not far from Nagpur city and thence turning to the northeast found his way into the Balaghat hills forming the northeastern boundary of the Nagpur plain country. These hills are from 1700 to 2800 feet above the level of the sea and for about 20 to 30 miles from the scarp are covered with dense forests of bamboos and various kinds of trees and quite uninhabited except by a very few widely scattered villages of the aboriginal tribes of gonds and bigas here too his pursuers followed and tried by pitfalls and other devices to capture him but without avail here in these beautiful hills and forests he remained and roamed about wherever he liked everywhere he found abundance of food in the fruits foliage and roots he was seldom disturbed or even seen by any human being and never damaged or even visited the few scattered patches of rough cultivation within his reach when in 1868 i joined the balaghat district as deputy commissioner he was in the pathless forests further north in the bisankhat range and on the borders of the mandla district he was on rare occasions seen by the wild forest tribes but it was only in the rainy season that he sometimes visited the semi-cultivated tracts in the neighborhood of bhimlat where he was said sometimes to have amused himself by playing with the plows left in the fields and carrying them from one village to another apparently he did not much damage the crops for no complaints were ever made about him there are in the central provinces no wild elephant anywhere except the matin and aprora zamindaris of the bilaspur district some 250 miles from these jungles this elephant therefore hard pressed for companions was said to pass most of his time with two wild buffaloes which sometimes so the rumors were he used to chastise in his displeasure on several occasions when passing through the forests i used to come upon his huge footprints several months old made during the preceding wet season i used to inquire about him but my time was too much occupied with my official duties to admit of my entertaining any idea of following him up moreover i was not satisfied that it would be right to kill a harmless animal which if by any chance captured would prove both useful and valuable it would have been quite a wild goose chase to have followed him without obtaining certain information and fresh tracks it was not until the cold weather of 1870 1871 that this elephant brought himself conspicuously to the notice of the public by entering the mandla district and killing several people having no personal knowledge of his exploits in that district i cannot perhaps do better than copy some official papers that were published at the time in the local official gazette The elephant is reported to have killed 21 persons, 6 men, 8 women and 7 children between 27th of January and 17th of February. According to the reports made by the police, the elephant made his appearance in the night of 26th 27th of January in the Saliwara circle in the east of the district at the village of Taraj, about 9 miles south of the station house. The villagers first took refuge on the roofs of the houses. but a woman and a child attempted to escape by running away and thus attracted the brute's attention he pursued and killed them both close to the village on the night of the 30th of january he killed a woman at barbaspur 9 miles west of kukramat outpost in the ramgarh circle 
tearing her from limb to limb. And on the night of the 1st of February, he killed a man and a woman at Kamria, a village near Barbaspur. On his next approaching Dongria, the villagers tried to escape by flight, but he overtook and killed two old women, tearing them to pieces. The villagers declared he actually devoured these women. One woman at this place had a narrow escape with her life, the elephant having placed his foot on her chest. From here he appears to have gone to Manori, twelve miles south of Ramgarh at night, and killed a woman and two children whose bodies were not recovered. The report of this did not reach the station house till some twenty days after the occurrence. It was made by the Kothwal, or the village watchman, who stated he was an eyewitness of the tragedy. Passing on, he came on the morning of the 5th of February to Karbeli, nine miles south of Ramgarh, and twice entered and left the village, killing a baby which he snatched from its mother's arms. And the same evening he killed a man at Katholi Dadar, an ancient village. This victim he is said to have devoured. Thence, at 8 p.m. that night, going to Nighari in the same neighborhood, he killed and is said to have devoured an old woman, 80 years of age. On the night of February the 7th, he came past the Ramgarh Tahsil and station house into the adjacent village of Omerpur. The police turned out to the number of 12 or 14 and fired at him. He retreated towards Bijori, a mile to the east, and killed a man and a boy on the banks of the Nala. The next night he appeared and surprised on some hills three or four miles west of Ramgarh some people of Nanda who had through fear deserted their village and taken refuge in the jungle. He took a baby out of its mother's arms and destroyed it. From Ramgarh the elephant turned off towards Shahapura to the north and surprising some travellers of Shahapura killed one of them. He killed seemingly on the succeeding night a man at Beljara some eight miles east of Balgao. Thence, he seems to have gone off to Salaya, a village near the Meswani outpost, without doing further mischief on the way. Salaya, I should say, must be 25 to 30 miles from Belgara. At Salaya, which he reached on the 14th of February, the villagers all escaped in time, save one boy who was rolled about and apparently played with by the elephant, which left him without killing him, and then went into the village and pulled down several houses. The next report states that on the 15th of February, the elephant wounded a man and a woman at Matiari, 12 miles west of Meswani outpost, rolling them about on the ground and inflicting various injuries, but not killing them. He also destroyed a house in the village. The next report is from the Narayan Ganj station house, dated 19th of February, stating that the elephant had, on the night of the 17th, killed one man and wounded another at Bistaria. 21 miles north of the station house, and that on the 21st the chief constable started with a party in pursuit. Soon after the first reports were received, the deputy commissioner, in my absence from the station, directed a reinforcement of six policemen to be sent to Ramgarh station house. These men took up the pursuit of the elephant and followed him across the Narbada River near Mheswani into the Narayan Ganj circle where they were joined by the chief constable of that station house. The elephant recrossed the Narbada River near Srirangarpur in the Mandala circle towards the end of February. I arrived at Srirangarpur the day after he had come there. From the traces found, there seems to be no doubt that he took refuge in a large hill called Daldali Pahar, which is covered with thick jungle. I think that there is little doubt that the constable's pursuit of the brute rendered him timid and disinclined to attack human beings as recklessly as before. He appears also to have been wounded. He is a fine, large animal, with tusks said to be about three or four feet in length. He, no doubt, commenced this series of attacks being in a state of must and the cessation of his blood-thirstiness may be also imputed partly to the cessation of his must. I am not sufficiently acquainted with elephants to say how long they remain in that state. In 1868, and also in the following years, a wild elephant, possibly this one, appeared in the district, but did no mischief to life and little to property.
This is the plain official report of the Superintendent of Police of the Mandala District of the performances of this elephant in that district in the early part of 1871. During the seven months of hot weather and rainy season, nothing was either heard or seen of the animal. But with the approach of the cold weather again, he became must, and distinguished himself as shown in the following narrative. On the afternoon of the 2nd of November, 1871, I had just completed the trial of a heavy criminal case, and was sitting in the small courtroom in the wonderful building that in those days accommodated everybody and everything representing the government in the district, when in walked F. A. Naylor, the officer in charge, that is, district superintendent of police, and said, That man-eating elephant that killed so many people in the Mandla district in the beginning of the year has appeared in this district and killed and partly devoured a man near Bahir. The headquarters of the Tahsildar, or the subdivisional officer, of that part of the district. I said, well, all right, we must stop his fun, and we'll start as soon as possible. That evening, when our work was done, we prepared our batteries and ammunition. It may interest some of you to know what they consisted of. Mine were two twelve-bore breech loaders, recently made to order through Mr. G. W. Bales of Ipswich. The rifle weighed twelve pounds with twenty-eight-inch barrels, grooved after Forsyth's high-initial-velocity principle, and carrying spherical-faced solid lead conical bullets weighing six and a half to the pound, or about 1,077 cranes each. Ordinarily, with these, I used four and a half to five drams of gunpowder, but for this special business I loaded with nearer six than five drams. My second weapon was a rather heavy, smooth bore with four drams of powder and spherical bullets. Naylor had a rather heavy number 12 single-barreled rifle and a number 12 smoothbore. This being the time of the year when civil officers are expected to be often out in the district under canvas, all our equipage with buffaloes for carriage was ready. Without loss of time, we started. Naylor had to go due north, considerably out of his way, to attend to a police case at Mao in the upper Waiganga Valley, promising to join me with the least possible delay at Bihir, and thence take up the trail together. I went by the direct route via the Wari, or Windy Pass, up the hills, 700 feet high towards Bihir. Fortunately, during the three years I had held charge of the district, I had caused the Baigas, the wildest of the wild Aboriginal tribes of the central provinces, to become my great friends. When I first knew them in 1868, they left their villages and disappeared in the jungles whenever any government official or stranger approached. But by this time they had become very friendly, and not only joined my camp whenever I marched anywhere near their villages, but also occasionally paid me flying visits in the plains below. They are a chip of the block of Aborigines who from time to time had been severed and pushed back by the various tribes that have invaded India. They, and those like them, are now to be found in only a few remote places. They live in as wildly natural and primitive a state as any people in the world. The whole worldly possessions of one of their families consist of vessels worth altogether about one shilling. Their houses are made of sticks, bamboos, grass and leaves, without even a thought of nail, saw or hammer, or any other tool save their ordinary axe. The clothing of these men consists of a strip of cloth a few inches wide round the loins, and a smaller and more ragged piece round the head. The women generally possess a piece sufficient to cover them from their armpits to their knees. As I passed under the frowning forest-clad cliffs of the Kandapahar Hill, I did not forget a very snug little village of Narodia Baigas that was safely hidden from view in the secluded nook far up near the summit. Anticipating that some tracking would have to be done, I sent word to the Baigas to join my camp. That afternoon, the 3rd of November of 1871, I reached Jatta, a small village about eight miles south of Behir. There I found, encamped, Mr. Hankin, district superintendent of the Mandla police. He told me that he had pursued the elephant from the Mandla district, but could not get near it. 
He said the more he pressed it and the harder he worked to get near it, the further it seemed to get away from him. He was a keen sportsman, and I was much disappointed when he told me he could not possibly stay and help me, but must return the next morning to his own district. On further inquiry, I found that on the 27th of October, the elephant had invaded Singbag Tola. Tola are a clusters of houses detached from the main part of the village, which is a small hamlet of Behir, about 15 miles from the Mandla border. At this time of the year, when the crops sown in June, the beginning of the rainy season, are well advanced towards harvest, the cultivators whose lands are within reach of wild animals erect machans, or platforms on poles, ten to twelve feet high, and covered over with an arch of bamboo matting, in their fields, from which to watch their crops and drive away wild animals such as deer of all kinds and wild pigs. Where these abound, tigers, panthers and bears are occasional visitors, and therefore it is necessary to have the platforms a considerable height from the ground. Though sometimes, as in the case of the celebrated man-eating panther of Asola of the Wartha district, panthers that have acquired a taste for human blood mount the machans and drag down the occupants. Hence, in jungly places, the practice is of two persons to occupy one machan. One sleeps while the other watches. A fire is frequently kept burning near the foot of the machan. That night, at Singbag Tola, an old gond and his son were thus watching their crops. In the middle of the night, when the cold in these uplands keeps all the thinly clad natives in as warm places as they find, the son heard approaching the heavy footsteps of some animal that never before had visited his fields. No tiger, no panther, or other small animal could make noises such as now that fell upon his ears with ever-increasing distinctness. At last, when it had come quite near, he realized that it was an elephant, and as there were no elephants, tame or wild, within at least fifty miles, he knew that it must be the dreaded animal that a few months before had destroyed so many human beings in the Mandla district. He immediately awoke his father, and hurrying down from the machan, and calling for his father to run for his life, he ran off to the village as far as his legs could carry him. His father endeavoured to follow him, but was too late. The huge brute was upon him, and quickly smashed him up into the shapeless mass he was found by his family when the next day they came to search for him. Where the elephant went on the 28th of October, no one knows. But on Sunday night, the twenty-ninth, he appeared in the fields north of the village of Jatta. There he entered the rice fields of Agund, who with his wife was in a machan keeping watch. The wife, a mere child, was on the alert, for she had heard of the doings of the elephant two nights before. As soon as she became aware of his approach, she roused her husband, and remembering that two boys were in a machan in the next field, rushed down, and calling the boys, fled with them to the village. Here, as in other places, all the houses belonging to a village are clustered close together. Her husband, apparently, did not believe her when she first gave the alarm, and was not so quick in his movements as he might have been. The elephant pursued and killed him. The next day his scattered remains were found, the head nearly severed from the body. The lower part of the body, with the right leg attached, was some distance away, and the left leg had been torn off and thrown several yards further. Not being able to find any more victims in the field on the north of the village, the elephant wandered round to the south. The watchers, scattered about the fields, became aware of his approach, and fled to the village. But one poor old gund, who certainly was not capable of much running, told me that as the others fled, he necessarily fell behind. He ran for dear life as fast as he possibly could. But behind him, the heavy crashing of the elephant through the standing rice came nearer and nearer. At last, in his frantic efforts to get away, he turned completely over and fell on his back, and before he could get up, the elephant was upon him and thrust his two huge tusks deep into the ground on either side of his body. I thought, the old man told me, that I should be immediately killed, so I placed my hands, one on each of the tusks, and called to our god Ganeshji, and immediately 
the elephant left me and went away. This was certainly a most extraordinary escape, and I questioned the old man with a view to ascertain how much he had drawn upon his imagination, but he consistently maintained his story, and was quite sure he had his hands on the elephant's tusks. The elephant next went to a small hamlet called Teli Tola, to the southwest of the village of Banderi. There he amused himself by pushing in and pulling down the walls and roofs of six houses and helping himself to the grain he found stored therein. The houses of the goons are but flimsy structures, quite unable to resist anything approaching such a ponderous attack. The walls are merely coarse bamboo mats, plastered within and without with mud. The roofs are made with rafters about the size of one's arm, laid and tied on with strips of bark without anything approaching a nail. Much of the inside of the houses of the poorer classes is occupied by large square dolhas, or receptacles of bamboo matting, made airtight by being plastered with mud inside and outside. At the gathering in of the harvest, these are filled with grain for the use of the household. The elephant went from house to house, lifting up the thatch, knocking in the gable ends, and inserting his huge trunk into the grain dolhas, and breaking the earthen vessels, and devouring and scattering everything he could reach. Had he eaten what he wanted, and left the remainder alone, he would have done comparatively little damage, but he seemed to delight in scattering about and destroying everything he could touch. As the inmates of each house he attacked fled, he pursued them, but when they escaped from him, he returned to their houses and completed his work of destruction. Many of the people thus frightened collected in the house of the local Pujari, the person who performs all religious ceremonies and pretends to cast out devils, decide boundaries, shuts tigers' mouths, and so forth. But the elephant had no regard for all these things, and came to the Pujari's house. This was a fine opportunity for the Pujari to display his priestly powers. This he attempted to do, for when the elephant began to pull his house to pieces, he took up a position inside the doorway and said, O oh, Ganesh Maharaj, spare me this time. I have many children in the house, and I am a poor man. The elephant then shook his head, being evidently deaf to all his prayers, and turning round, went out off the enclosure to commence to tear down the back of the house. This was too much for the terror-stricken people huddled together inside. They all, headed by the Pujari, fled to the village of Banderi and remained there for two days. This was the state of affairs when I arrived with my camp at Jatta on the morning of the 3rd of November, 1871. The elephant had disappeared, and no one could give me any clue as to the direction he had taken. The small piece of partially cleared country in which Behir and Jatta are situated is surrounded on all sides by hills as much as 1,000 feet above, covered and embedded in thick, pathless tree and bamboo jungles, and shoots of the vast forest tracts that stretch in the north through the Mandla district to Riva. On the east of the hills bordering the west and north of the Chhattisgarh plain round to Amarkantak, south to the wilds of Bustar, and west to the range overhanging the Waiganga Valley. Mr. Hankin had sent out scouts, but they had not returned, and nothing could be learned about the monster further than that he had been seen going south after pulling down the houses in Teritola and was probably hidden in the jungles hard by. In short, the elephant would have proved a veritable needle in the haystack of the surrounding forests had not my good friends, the Baigas from Kanda Pahar, been at hand ready to assist. I advanced them a few rupees to supply themselves with food, and sent them off to the south to extend east and west as they went, and to send back at once and report as soon as they struck any certain or likely trail. Having thus made my dispositions, I could do nothing but wait for information. Without it to move at all might take me in the wrong direction. I had not long to wait, for in the afternoon some of the Baigas of Diodongar Hill brought a message from my detachment of Baigas I had sent south that three days before the elephant had passed through the Baiga village of Jagla, nine miles south of Jatta. Later in the day, 
Another report from the same direction came to the effect that the elephant had passed through the Baiga village of Limoti, and the following day had killed two men in the villages of Kundapahar and Mandar, fourteen miles further south. This information was most satisfactory, for it left no doubt as to the direction the elephant had taken. The next morning, early when the first sign of daylight appeared, I started in pursuit. The track we had to follow lay through the wildest country, rugged, stony hills covered with occasionally a small open valley that marked the site where, after the forest had been cut down by the baigas, goons had settled and by their plough cultivation had broken up the land and prevented the forest from recovering itself. However, the overhanging trees had not prevented the lower growth of vegetation. The rank grass and reeds were about seven feet high, and were so wet from the heavy dews that always prevail at that time of the year, that although I was riding a fourteen-hand Arab stallion, I had not gone far before my clothes were wet through up to my waist. And as for my attendants, who were on foot, the heavy grass that overhung our path drenched them from head to foot. I selected for this work the Bay Arab Mozart, a horse that a few years before had carried off everything on the Compte race course and was perfect in courage and steadiness, even though a gun was fired off between his ears. All the way we followed the tracks of the huge monster. Wherever the ground was soft, his footprints were perfect, and every now and then one of my attendants would stop and measure the prints. Eight or nine cubits was the least they put him at, for had not the people of the villages he had already attacked told them he was as tall as the riches of their houses, with tusks equal to a man's height in length. On the way we learned that during Monday, 30th of October, and Tuesday, the elephant had been in the Barwahi jungles, and then following on his way to the little huts which the Baigas had erected on their clearings as watch houses, and with one solitary exception, had eaten all the grain in them. The village of Jagla was situated on the very highest point of a hill, about 2,700 feet above the level of the sea rising abruptly some 800 feet from the expanse of almost trackless and impenetrable forest. It was itself densely covered with bamboo and tree forest, except in a few places where the huge boulders of granite, piled one above another, defied the efforts of the hardiest shrub to obtain a footing. As we approached, no road or well-marked path showed that any human habitation was near, and no voice of man or animal domesticated or otherwise, broke the stillness of the vast solitude. Our Baiga guide steadily followed the narrow track the elephant had followed. It appeared to be no more than a wild animal's track marked by the blazes on the trees that the Baigas always make to show the way to their newly formed settlement. The top of the hill, not an acre in extent, had been cleared of all trees and undergrowth, and in the middle of it stood the small square of Baiga houses, closed all round with merely a narrow passage between two of the houses in the northwest corner. In the centre was the usual mandua, and close to it a stout pole about ten feet high, surrounded by a bunch of peacock's feathers, and below this bunch stuck into it a small axe with a head only three and a half inches long by one quarter inches wide, and a hair rope and iron whip hung over it. The small axe is dedicated to Bhimsain, and the gurs, or the iron whip, to Khanshamdeo. These things showed that the pujari of the village was a professed medicine man, who, when possessed by his deo, could, while flogging himself unharmed with the iron whip, effect miraculous cures of all ailments. But his miraculous powers availed him nothing, when on that Tuesday of the 31st of October, midnight, the sleeping village was suddenly aroused by the lifting up of the roof and the crashing in of the gable end on the northeast of the square. The fame of the destroyer had come before him, so that even if the brilliant tropical moon had not rendered the elephant clearly visible, they would all have known the meaning of the crashing, tearing sound. So rapidly did he break into the first house that the Baiga and his wife had barely any time to make their escape into the Pujari's house on the south of the square where the other inhabitants 
quickly collected in the hope that the holiest and strongest of the houses would escape or resist all attacks. The elephant, not finding anything in the first house, partly broke down and explored several others, and then walking into the middle of the square examined the pole and the things on it. All this time, the trembling, shivering baigas crowded into the pujari's house, watched through the many crevices in the walls the movements of the monster, and when they saw him leave the houses and go to the standard, they thought he had finished his work of destruction. But, to their horror, he turned towards the pujari's house and began tearing it and lifting up the roof of the house. The baigas described to me the terrible state of fear they were in, as they crouched, shivering at one end of the gradually crumpling hut. They fortunately uttered not a sound, and as they described it, ceasing to breathe, their bodies dried up. Had they made any noise, the bloodthirsty brute would certainly have forced his way in and smashed up some of them. Certainly some of the people that had interviewed this elephant did seem literally dried up, for as they told me their stories a few hours afterwards, they seemed absolutely terror-stricken, and with their hands clasped before them, shrank as if still overshadowed by the elephant. Their brown skins prevented their faces from looking pale, but their color changed to a livid hue as if halfway to death. Just as the poor Baigas began almost to feel the breath of the elephant as he moved his trunk about inside the house, the brute suddenly stopped his work of destruction, and turning out of the village, stood on the edge of the plateau, leisurely swinging about his trunk, tail, and one or other of his legs with that restlessness so universal with healthy elephants. After standing in this way a few minutes, the elephant turned, and going in a southerly direction, disappeared in the forest. I have never ceased to wonder why, after forty years of wildlife in the hills and forests in the north, this wonderful creature deliberately turned to the south and made his way towards those plains where he had spent his early days in captivity. Was it instinct, or was it fate that thus led him back to his destruction? A few hours after leaving Jagla, the elephant appeared at Limoti, another Baiga village a few miles further south, another small inhabited spot in this vast ocean of forest. There, three wayfaring goons were sleeping in the open mandwa in the village square. They were awakened by the approach of the elephant and immediately jumped in and fled in different directions into the jungle. One was pursued by the elephant, but escaped among the rocks and bushes. Before the elephant could return to the village, the baigas had all collected together, and with all their drums made such a clamor that the brute turned off into the jungle. I reached Limoti that evening, my men and animals thoroughly tired out by their scramble through rocks and forest tangle. Here I held a consultation with all my baiga friends, among whom were some fine, grey-bearded pujaris who could read the jungles and the signs thereof better than most people. They all agreed that it was most probable that the elephant, when he reached the plains in the south, would feel out of his element and turn again north into the hills. I therefore sent out two strong detachments of baigas, one to the east and the other to the west, to prevent the elephant from doubling back north without my being aware of his movements. They were instructed to spread themselves in a long line through the forest, so that he could not possibly pass north unnoticed. On the morning of the 5th of November, leaving behind all needless impediments, and taking only a small shouldari tent and other things that could be carried on men's shoulders, I moved on 23 miles via Karajuri, Kudapahar, and Koderi, below the Khads to Suswa in the plains of the Hutta Pagana. The first 18 miles were chiefly through absolutely trackless forest. The Baigas alone could possibly have guided me through. In many places there was absolutely no track or path, but the trail of the elephant, which the Baigas were following without a check, kept us in the right direction. Sometimes piles of granite rock through which it was impossible to pass a horse blocked the way, and long detours had to be made to get round them. How the elephant managed to get through or over them is a mystery. Soon after I started, I met some men from the plains below 
and was not a little surprised to learn from them that the elephant had left the hills and killed two persons at the village of Goderi in the plains. Up to this, I had felt almost sure that the elephant would turn back as soon as he reached the passes leading into the plains, and I expected soon to meet him. At Karajuri, six miles south of Nimboti, some goons returning from their fields carrying a large round earthen vessel full of kutki, or panicum malicum, suddenly caught sight of the elephant coming towards them. In an instant, they had put down the vessel and disappeared in the long grass and undergrowth. The elephant heard the noise and, looking round, failed to see the fugitives. But perceiving the vessel, which stood on the track the goons were following, he came to it and, knocking it to pieces with his forefoot, ate as much as he liked and scattered the remainder. He must have eaten very little, for when we passed by, we found the grain scattered over a large surface and pieces of the vessel thrown to a considerable distance. Karajuri was a village in name only, for it consisted of nothing but a few small huts scattered among tall forest trees that had been left when the land was cleared. The lowest branches must have been some thirty feet from the ground, and the huts in consequence appeared unusually small. The whole scene reminded me of pictures of Central Africa. Leaving the small clearing around Karajuri, we tracked the elephant through thick bamboo jungle with but few large forest trees. This showed that the country had not many years before been cleared by the Baigas and wilder classes of Gons. Sufficient time had not elapsed for the forest trees to recover themselves, but the quick-growing bamboos had quickly taken possession and covered the whole surface. Viewed from the top of some of the huge piles of granite that were met with in several places, the jungle appeared like a softly rippled surface covered with soft emerald green velvet. All the way we passed through beautiful bamboo arches of every shape and size. Where the soil was thin and stony, they were so low that my men on foot could scarcely pass under, and I had to dismount to get my horse through. But where the alluvial soil lay rich and thick, the large bamboos, commonly called katango, rose up to more than ninety feet in height. After going about four miles, we came to the small, goned village of Kudapahar. November the 1st, on Wednesday, the elephant visited this goned village of Kudapahar at night and killed a cowherd who was warming himself by a fire. He jumped up and ran into the jungle, where the elephant followed him and found and killed him. The same night, the elephant visited Mandar village, and knocked over a machan in the fields and trampled underfoot the gond who was sleeping in it. Leaving Kudapahar, I soon came to a pass leading about one thousand feet down into the plains below. I did not follow the elephant's track, but having reliable information as to his movements, I took the shortest route. There was nothing but a winding track over and between the boulders of granite of every shape and size. It was absolutely impossible to ride down, and with great difficulty I was able to lead my horse down, literally crawling, slipping, and stumbling about without doing himself any serious damage. Immediately, at the foot of the hills, I came to the village of Bhanpur, a small, goned village nearly hidden in the bamboos close to the foot of the hills. Here and there, amongst the houses, were a few large tamarind trees, spreading their huge arms around like large, pollarded oaks. These were no longer the abode of flying foxes and birds, but bore a plentiful crop of large platforms made of branches and leaves. The people told me that when the news of the invasion of Kudapahar by the mad elephant reached them, they at once made these machans for places of refuge at night or on the arrival of the elephant, and since then they had ceased to occupy their houses at night, but always before darkness came on, mounted up into these places. Many civilized human beings would have been unable to do so, for a single bamboo with its branches cut off short was the only possible way up, and a very rickety and shaky way it was too. The elephant did not, however, visit this village, having evidently descended the hills further south, near the village of Goderi. He first came to the Tola of Goderi and knocked down two houses, killed a Marar girl, ten years old, after chasing her mother and several other people who managed to hide in a deep water course while the rest fled to the jungle. After that, the elephant turned towards the village, 
that is the main collection of houses of Koderi, where many of the people had made their abode high up on the trees. After tearing down part of a bamboo enclosure, he turned towards the center of the village, where the cowherd, who with his cattle had fled from Kudapahar, was encamped under a large kadam tree. But suddenly turning off, went in an easterly direction towards the Deo River that flows under the scarp of the hills. There, on the dry sand in the river bed, eight men, who had come from the neighboring village of Bargao for bamboos, were sleeping, and a few paces from them were five thimmas, or fishermen, and a boy named Fogal. The moon was shining, but these people being close under the hills, they were in comparative darkness. This boy happened to be awake. Hearing a noise, he looked up and saw something coming towards them. At first, he thought it was a tiger. But by the time he had awakened the others, the huge outline of the elephant was within a few yards of them. They all immediately jumped up, and with the exception of one, the marar, fled into the thick jungle up the side of the overhanging hill. The elephant pursued them, but by separating in the thick scrub, they prevented him from coming with them. He then turned to the bed of the river. The marar had run about four hundred yards down the right bank and, slipping down the bank, hid in some thick tamarisk bushes. The footprints showed that the brute had traced this man step by step, and when he came to where he was hidden, he put his four feet together and slipped down the bank until he was within reach of the man who must have been completely hidden from view. He, however, pulled him out and smashed him to pieces. When I arrived, I found the remains still lying there. The arms and legs looked as if there were no bones in them, for they pointed in all directions, and the body and head, besides being flattened, had been disfigured by jackals. That morning I had started before sunrise, when there was barely sufficient light for the baigas to take up the trail, and although I could not have come more than eighteen miles, it was two o'clock in the afternoon when I arrived at Goderi. While my men were resting and obtaining food, I rode around making enquiries. All around was thick jungle, and no one had ventured into them since the elephant came. Owing to the hills, the south and west were the only directions in which the elephant could have gone. As no one could give me any definite information of where the elephant was, I caused the Goderi headman to send out two search parties of four each to get information with instructions to return as soon as possible. At 4 p.m. no news had arrived, and nothing had been heard of the search parties. I could wait no longer. I had several miles of jungle to pass through, and the evenings being very short at that time of the year, I had but little time to do it in. The people all said that the elephant was not far off, so, shouldering my rifle, loaded and ready for action, I marched off, preceded by two of my baigas, and followed by the remainder of my party. Rumor had it that the elephant had killed several men in Mate and seven in Suswa villages, so I followed the road west to the latter village. I had not proceeded a mile into the jungle when I met altogether the eight men who had been sent out as scouts, four to the west and four to the south. I called out to them, Where is the elephant? expecting to hear they had marked him down nearby. We don't know where he is, You had better be quick through the jungle, or you will meet him on the road. On we went, keeping a sharp lookout, and a few minutes after darkness had come on, we arrived in Suswa, in the open country beyond. This night I pitched my tent, and accommodated all my people inside a closed courtyard belonging to the village headman. My poor naked baigas felt the cold much, so I arranged for them an outhouse with a good wood fire in the middle There, with all the food they wanted, the doors closed, and the place full of smoke. They were perfectly happy. The Suswa people told me that the elephant had killed ten men at the next village of Mate, and gone off in an easterly direction to Kinhi. I also learned that after killing the people at Goderi, he had gone to the neighboring jungles of Batkari, where he was seen by several people the next day. At 4 p.m. that afternoon, he walked into the little village of Mandora and began pulling down the houses. The inhabitants fled into the jungles on the north, except one old man who rushed down south towards the Deo River, followed by the elephant. 
Before he reached the water, the elephant had seized him and, lifting him up in his trunk, smashed him to pieces against his uplifted foot until the other people, amongst them his son, who were looking on from the high ground on the other side of the village, saw only a tempa, or splinter, left in the brute's trunk. At 7 p.m. that evening, we returned to this village and then went towards Mate. Leaving Suswa early in the morning of 6th of November, I came to Mate village. The whole village turned out to meet me, and as I rode through their fields, they told me the destruction the elephant had caused, and that to propitiate him they had held grand ceremonies in honor of their god Ganesh, and had freshly covered with brilliant vermilion paint all images of him. Since the elephant's visit, they had all slept inside the village in the strongest of houses. About 11 p.m. on Friday, 3rd of November, 1871, before the moon had risen, the elephant was seen in the village coming towards a group who were warming themselves beside a fire. The elephant knocked down a machan in which were Ramu Marar and his nephew, and the nephew was killed while Ramu remained quiet when he fell. After this, the elephant left Mate and turned west towards Kesa, and the elephant killed a man and a woman. Thence from Kesa, the elephant turned again westward towards Dhatta, another small village in the plain, and entered the fields in the early hours of Saturday, the 4th of November, 1871, and killed one man and a girl six years old. Thus, in two nights, the 3rd of November, Friday, and Saturday, the 4th of November, 1871, did this unequalled, savage brute kill and pound to pieces ten human beings and wounded two others. A piece of butchery that has never before been anywhere approached by any man-eating tiger or any other brute. A record that is not likely to be surpassed or even equaled. It is a most extraordinary fact that, though none of these villages were ten miles away from Goderi, where two persons were killed the night before, yet no one had heard that he had killed some people at Kuda Pahar and Mandar in the jungles above the hills, but they could not believe that the brute would leave the forests and venture out into the open plain. During the whole of the forenoon of Saturday, the 4th of November, 1871, the elephant was in a scrub jungle between the village of Saleh and the Deo River. Hundreds of people collected on the high ground on either side, and from a good safe distance watched the brute feeding on the bamboos in the ravines, and enjoying himself in the water of the Deo River. That day there was the ordinary weekly market day, or bazaar, in Dhaidi. About 3 p.m., some 14 or 15 people of Mate, headed by Ganpat Singh, the tall and stalwart Rajput headman, and armed with two guns, swords, etc., determined to make an effort to reach the Dhaidi market. They arranged that they would first reconnoiter from the high banks of the river, and then, if necessary, having fired off a shot or two at him to pass over to the market. Accordingly, they all walked down to a place where the river bank was very high and perpendicular with a large, deep pool of water below. There, eight of them were standing, all in a row, vainly looking for their enemy, when suddenly one of those who had lagged behind rushed up, shouting, Run! Run! The elephant has come! They turned round, and there, sure enough, was the elephant, with his ears up close upon them, entirely cutting off their escape by land. A moment's delay meant certain destruction to one or more of them. So sudden and terrifying was the surprise that no one thought of their weapons. But dropping them into the water beneath, they all jumped in after them, and holding on to the long grass, Growing out of the bank, they hung there with only their heads above water. Looking up, they saw the elephant's head above them, and his huge trunk moving backwards and forwards, trying to reach them. The last man to take to the water was Faizu Pinjala, who almost felt the elephant's breath as he dropped out of reach. He was so thoroughly terrified that the sight of the huge trunk stretching from above towards him was too much for him. He let go of the grass he was holding and swam towards the opposite bank. Immediately, the elephant saw him, and he rushed along downstream until he came to a place where the bank was a little sloping, and there, putting his forefeet together and going down on his hind knees, slid down into the water, making two huge furrows as he went. Faizu saw this just as he reached the sand on the other side. 
Across this he rushed and scrambled up a perpendicular bank about five feet high, caused by the slit in a dry watercourse being cut away by the falling flood in the river. He had barely climbed up to a few feet into a tree, when the elephant breasted it and stretched out his trunk to seize him. How far was his trunk from you then, Faizu? I asked when I came up, and he with his face still showing his fear and his eyes staring from their sockets, held up his left arm and grasping it at the elbow with his right arm, he replied, Itna bacha, or just so much. Not reaching his victim, the elephant pulled down several boughs off the tree, but not being able to get up the steep bank, he turned downstream, found a way up the bank and came back to the tree. The tree was not large, and again the elephant, failing to reach the man, broke down all the boughs he could reach all around the tree, and then, after waiting for some time, moved slowly away and disappeared in the undergrowth. Darkness had come on before Faizu ventured to go home, where his pursuit and destruction by the elephant had been duly reported by his companions, who had lost no time in getting out of the river and running home as soon as the elephant followed Faizu. When I heard of this performance of this elephant, I began to think he was a more formidable adversary than I had anticipated. I had comforted myself with the thought that although he might be bold and pursue people at night, he would not show much fight in daylight, but I could no longer doubt that his courage was as good by day as it was at night, and when we did meet, the fight would not be one-sided. Garnapat Singh of Mate afterwards told me, this elephant has so frightened me that the bare sight of your tame elephant makes me tremble. The news that the elephant had tried to kill Faizu and was coming soon reached the people assembled at the Dhaidi market. A general panic and stampede ensued, and everyone skeltered with as much as their own and other people's things as they could lay hands on, leaving not a little scattered about the ground. About sunset, the elephant was seen passing through the fields to the north of Saleh and breaking down all the machans as he went, when he turned round the hills towards Kinhi. The people of Saleh were well satisfied with themselves. The elephant had for a considerable time been quite near to their village, but had never once invaded it nor hurt any of the inhabitants. They particularly impressed this upon me and their headman, as I passed through, repeatedly assured me that frequent prayers, or puja, to the god Ganesh, and the many ceremonies performed in his honour, had caused the elephant to spare their lives and property. The people of Kinhi had no idea of the impending danger. They had heard that an elephant had killed several people above the hills, but had not heard of the havoc he had caused at Mate and the neighbourhood. The elephant then went off to the village of Kandra, about two miles north, and after he had partly demolished a house, disappeared in the jungle. He then went to the village of Kadabura and demolished a house. Thence he passed on to Kakori, about five miles south, and there threw a man in his machan and stamped upon the fleshy part of his leg, but he marvelously escaped without any further injury. Following up this trail of destruction from the early mornings at Suswa, I arrived about 3 p.m. at a place called Junawanitola. There, all I could learn was that in the early morning of 6th of November, 1871, he had crashed through some of the outer enclosures of the village and gone off in an easterly direction. Where he had gone to, no one knew. No one had left the village during the day, lest the monster should appear from the heavy jungle not a quarter of a mile away, and for the same reason no one had ventured to come from elsewhere. The continued trudge through the heat of two consecutive days had nearly worn us all out. There had been no halt since the morning, nothing to eat, but plenty of water as opportunity offered. I therefore collected them under a large tree just outside the village, and having arranged for food to be supplied to them, I mounted Mozart and rode off to find the trail. I came upon the trail outside Pipalgao, a man named Mr. Conby, in charge of the headman's threshing floor, had, as the day broke, seen the elephant approaching. Having thus struck the trail, I deputed several of the villagers to follow it up, and returned to Junawanitola to prepare my people for a fresh start. While I was doing this, a report came up that, as the day was breaking, the elephant had passed through Joditola, 
and had been seen in the jungles not far off. When we were nearly ready to move on, I was not a little pleased to see my friend Naylor ride up. I knew then that I had with me a companion on whom I could implicitly rely to stand with me against any charge the elephant might make or anything else he might do. I believed that Manohar Singh, my spare gun-bearer, would stand fire, though I felt some misgivings on the subject. Soon we were ready to start without spare gun-carriers and some of the baigas. At the edge of the jungle, two of the villagers I had sent forward offered to show us the trail. Leaving our horses outside, we entered the thick scrub and soon came upon the fresh tracks. It was not long, however, before we perceived that our village friends were showing the white feather, and instead of following the best trail, were fooling us by taking up the older ones. We at once sent them to the rear, and putting on Bakht and Garur, the two best baigas, and before we had gone a mile, came upon tracks so fresh that we expected every moment to see our enemy rush out. But we were disappointed, for just then we heard loud shoutings outside the jungle that the elephant had appeared. At first we thought the frightened villagers had made a mistake and had seen the tame elephant we had with us. But louder and louder grew the shouts, and no room was left for doubt. We rushed out of the jungle to our horses, and mounting, rifles in hand, galloped back to Kakori, where the brute was said to be. Close by Kakori village, we rounded a corner of the jungle, and there, about a quarter of a mile ahead, we saw the huge black monster, going away just outside the scrub. We galloped after him, but before we could get within shot, he disappeared into the jungle. It was then nearly dark, and nothing more could be done. It appears that he had coolly strolled out of the jungle towards Kakori and amused himself by knocking over the machans and kicking down the banks of the rice fields without deigning to notice some twenty or thirty men who from a safe distance were watching his operations. Darkness had come on before we reached Junavanitola, where I had ordered our tent to be pitched. I had previously cautioned my people, since we had commenced the chase, that it was most important to pass the night in secure places, so that all might sleep undisturbed. What then was my disgust to find that notwithstanding we had sighted the enemy, and knew that he must be in the jungle nearby, our people had located themselves in an exposed position well away from the village. On a mound close to the jungle stood a square of large mango trees, planted at regular intervals except in one place on the jungle side. By this gap they had pitched our little tent. A large fire was burning in the middle of the square, and round this were clustered our native attendants. There was nothing to prevent the elephant from attacking us whenever he liked. But not wishing to show any anxiety, we made the best dispositions we could for the night. It being certain death to our dogs to leave them outside exposed in these jungles, we fastened them to pegs round the inside of our tent, that they might give the alarm on anything unusual approaching. Then, between our two beds of straw, we placed a chair with matches and a candle on it, and weapons heavily loaded leaning against it, well within our reach. In fact, we quite filled the tent. All ought to have been asleep by nine o'clock. We slept lightly, but whenever we awoke, we heard the incessant, subdued chatter of the natives sitting round the fires, and it was quite certain that they were not getting much sleep. About two o'clock in the morning, I was awake, and I heard a servant say, Are Manohar Singh, did you hear that? Manohar Singh said, No, what is it? The servant replied, Listen, there's the elephant breaking down something. Immediately afterwards, a servant rushed to our tent and exclaimed, Sahib, Sahib, the elephant is coming. In a moment we were up, and rifles in hand, were standing in the dark outside our tent, ready for action. A distant... certainly could be heard, and there could be no doubt that it was the destroyer at work. Exactly what was being broken, it was impossible to tell though in the stillness of the dark night no other sound could be heard, no human voice or cry of any kind. All in our camp was still as death, not a move anywhere. 
the tur tur gradually ceased, and all was quiet again. But we remained standing there, fully expecting that we should have our turn. But about ten minutes later, after the noise had ceased, the kotwal, or the village watchman of Lorangi, crept quietly into our camp, and trembling and shaking from fear, told us that the elephant had passed through their village, smashing down houses right and left as he went. Whither the brute had gone, they had no idea. Nothing, of course, could be done in the darkness. So, cautioning some of our men to be on the lookout, we again returned to our tent and fell asleep. After this, all remained quiet, and we were not disturbed until just as the false dawn began to lighten the eastern horizon, when one of our servants, rushing up to the tent and shaking us both in short of suppressed, terror-stricken voice, said, Sahib! Sahib! Here comes the elephant! Evidently meaning he was close upon us. In an instant, we were up and out again, barefooted and in our night suits, commonly in England called pajamas, and took our positions outside the tent facing the east. There he is, whispered our servant, and there, sure enough, was the huge outline, clear against the dimly lighted sky, of a dark mass moving slowly towards us. What will he do? I thought. Will he come for us or go for the tame she-elephant we had brought with us? But wait, where was the tame one? She was nowhere visible in the dim light, almost darkness under the trees surrounding our camp. So I shouted out, Where is the camp, elephant? A voice from the people on the trees replied, No one knows. When the alarm was given at midnight, the Mahout let her loose and got up one of the trees where he is now. I immediately turned to Naylor and said, Don't fire. That may be the tame one. We stood quite still and allowed the monster to approach. When it came within about twenty yards, without showing any signs of attack, we knew that it was the friend and not the enemy. The Mahout was called down from his lofty perch, where he had secured himself out of fear with some of his elephant ropes and gear. As soon as it was fairly daylight, we sent out men to bring in information of the evening's movements, and leaving our men to break their fast and prepare for another day's hard work, we walked over to Lorangi to see what damage had been done. Destruction more wholesale than I had yet seen met our eyes. The brute had literally walked straight through the village, not along the roads and paths, but through gardens and enclosures, breaking down houses and fences as he went. We had not finished our inspection of Lorangi when our scouts brought in word that about daybreak the elephant had disappeared into the jungles of Kosmara, about four miles to the east, after having chased several people of that place. It appears he had passed near Kosam Dehi, where he chased the village watchmen, destroying and knocking down houses and their store of corn. And thus the matters stood when we arrived at Kosmara at about 10 a.m., all the inhabitants of that village turned out to receive us, but of the other villages we had passed through that morning, not a single man accompanied us. All was intense excitement. The wrecked houses, the partially burned logs, and the unthreshed corn that the elephant had scattered about were all shown to us, and many people came forward to tell us of the perils they had escaped. We had no time to listen to their stories, for the time had arrived for real action. The fact that the elephant generally had begun his work about 4 to 5 p.m. and not retired into the jungles until 6 to 7 a.m. forced upon me the conclusion that about the middle of the day he must be asleep or bathing or otherwise recruiting himself. Many ways of destroying him had been suggested to me. For example, sitting upon a tree over the tied-up she-elephant, beating him out with much noise of drums, horns, firearms, etc., or following him up on horseback. But I had determined that, should the opportunity offer, we would walk up to him in dead silence in the middle of the day, and if possible, see him before he could see us. Now was the opportunity. We had come upon his last track in the very nick of time, so that we might probably come upon him at about noon the time most likely for him to be in his deepest sleep. There in front of us was pointed out on the opposite side of the Nala, 
or watercourse, into which he had chased Rupra, his huge footsteps up the bank and his wide track through the long grass and scrub above. Our arrangements were quickly made. First, the tame she-elephant was divested of all her trappings, and one of her heavy ropes was fastened round her body and neck and under the tail to enable the driver to stick on or step down in any direction necessary. We were determined to take her to attract the wild one, and thereby give ourselves the chance of an extra shot in the event of a dangerous charge. Leaving behind at the houses our horses and everything else we did not want, we formed our line of an advance. The two best baigas, Bakht and Garur, armed with spears, led the way, followed by me, Nailer, Manohar Singh with my smoothbore, Suklal Singh with Nailer's second gun, a policeman with police musket, two baigas, two other men leading my five dogs, taken ready to be slipped and create a diversion in case we were hard-pressed followed at last by the tame she-elephant and the last two more baigas. All expressed their readiness to accompany us, except the mahout or the elephant driver, who was in so manifest a state of fright that we had to assure him we would shoot him if he lagged behind. All were cautioned to make no more noise than was necessary, and that no one was to speak under any pretense whatsoever, except on a sudden attack by our enemy. Rupra volunteered to show us the way, but when we descended into the Nala and approached the track, he would come no further, having seen enough of the elephant. All three sets of baigas were cautioned to keep a sharp lookout, for with the grass and scrub above our heads, it was impossible to say from which direction the attack might come. He might very well double back near to his track and attack us from the rear. In this order we entered the track, the undergrowth of grass and scrub was above our heads, so thick that we could not see more than five or six yards through it. Slowly and without a sound, we steadily, for more than a mile, followed the trail, the leading baigas pausing occasionally closely to examine the trail and communicate the result by sundry movements of the hands. On a high piece of ground, overlooking a low place full of long reeds and grass, Bakht suddenly stopped. Starting out with excitement, and pointing forward with his right hand, he said in almost a whisper, or rather hissed out, Why, there he is, and drew back behind me. And there he was, sure enough, only thirty-five paces off, lying sound asleep in the long grass. He was evidently lying flat on his side with his back towards us, for we could see the huge arch of his ribs and some of his spine, no parts of his head, neck, or tail were visible. It would have been worse than useless, if indeed not absolutely foolish, to have fired at what I could see. So I began to creep forward and give him two good shots in the head at close quarters. But just as I began to move, Naylor touched me on the shoulder and signaled for me to move to the left. I had not taken three steps in that direction when I disturbed some dry leaves and twigs. This roused the elephant, and he immediately raised himself on his forefeet, as if to listen for more certain sounds. Now was the time his right ear was clearly visible. I fired straight at his ear entrance, and immediately afterwards a shot from Naylor followed. The brute disappeared for a moment, and, thinking to myself, now comes the charge, I reloaded the barrel I had fired. I had barely done so, when I saw the huge back of the brute going up the opposite bank. Again I fired, and hit him in the back. A cane pushed into the wound when he was dead, entered nearly three feet at the point where the bullet had struck. Again, loading, we gave chase as fast as we could, some of our followers, after their manner, calling out, Kub laga, or he is hit hard, he can't go far. The grass was very thick and high, and I could barely see ten yards ahead. But exclaiming to Naylor, he must be kept going, we must keep the pot boiling and not give him time to get himself together for a charge. We plunged along the track, not knowing the moment we might blunder up against him. About two hundred or three hundred yards on, we sighted him about forty yards ahead under a large tree, with his tail towards us, with a small piece of his right check visible. I immediately fired, and on he went again at a pace, 
that seemed that we should see him no more. There was no elephantine gallop or long trot that we sometimes see depicted. But after him we rushed, and again came suddenly upon him. This time his tail was also towards us, but I could just see behind his left ear, over which he was looking out for us. I got a good shot and planted a bullet behind his ear. In this way we went on for nearly a mile, pegging into him whenever we got a chance. At last, as we descended into a dry nala, we saw our enemy on the top of a high sloping bank opposite to us. He had chosen an admirable position and was apparently in the act of wheeling round for a charge. But his whole left broadside was exposed which Naylor immediately took advantage of and planted a bullet in the left side of his head. On this he spun round, exposing his right side, and I emptied both barrels into the region of his right ear. With a shrill trumpet he fell on his side, burying one of his tusks deep into the earth. Immediately the she-elephant, coming up behind, probably recognizing the death cry of her race, wheeled round and bolted to the rear doubtless encouraged therein by her timid rider. As we rushed up, two police muskets were fired into the fallen monster, but there was no movement except a few slow stretchings out of his trunk. The two leading bigas sprang forward, and balancing their spears above their heads, and shouting that they must put their spears into the Badmash Adam Khor, or scoundrel man-eater, plunged them in with all their might, though with microscopic effect. At first we could hardly believe our eyes. There lay the monster, the terror of the country for many miles, that for about a week had been the object of our every movement, and the subject of our every thought. The effect on our nerves was most peculiar. A heavy weight seemed lifted up, and innumerable tightly compressed springs unloosed. Our success had been complete. We threw our helmets into the air, and cheering, as if we should never cheer again, patted our bigas on the backs, and congratulated each other all around. The elephant was in perfect condition. His skin was glossy black, not the sickly brown of some poor elephants in confinement. Under the skin was a thick coating of fat, and so round was the body as the natives expressed it, as he lay on the ground, a man standing on one side could not see the man standing on the other side of it. The place where he fell was not far from the edge of the jungle so that the smoke of our last shots had hardly cleared away when the people from the villages outside began to stream in to gaze on the monster that many looked upon as the incarnation of one of their deities. Until darkness came on, and for two or three days afterwards, the people crowded in to see the wonder. Even as we marched away, we met many still going to see what remained. Our first thought was how to secure so grand a trophy, and we decided to preserve as much as possible. How to sever the head from the body was a puzzle. Among the spectators was a native gentleman armed with sword and daggers. We said to him, Now is your chance to test your weapons. But in vain he tried, for his sword, though fairly sharp, made hardly a visible scratch. Certainly the skin was very tough. We could not cut it at all, until with a sharp pointed leather cutter's tool, called a rapi, we had pierced it and made way for the insertion of a sharp knife. We wished to take off the head and take it to our camp, lest the hyenas and jackals should spoil it during the night. At last we severed the head from the body, but what was our astonishment when we found that all the men we could crowd round it, and all the power we could apply, were not sufficient to lift it onto the back of the tame elephant. Nothing could be done but leave it where it was, until by removing the skin and the flesh we could lighten and make it movable. We, however, took the precaution to cut a few boughs and place them on both the head and the body, having learned from our jungle experiences that no wild animal would come near them, knowing full well that wild animals do not sleep with boughs on them, and recognizing the presence of some human strangers would give it a wide berth. In the crowd that stood around, when the huge head and the four feet were being cut off, were many low-caste people who eat meat of any kind when they can get it, some even feasting on carcasses of animals that have died from any disease. For the benefit of these we called out that they had now a chance of a good meal all around. But all declined, and explained that their fathers and grandfathers before them had never eaten anything of the kind. 
They were in no way moved when we told them that we intended to eat some. That evening, we had a piece from one of the feet cooked, but it was so tough, like a steak from a huge ship's cable-cut crosswise, that we could get through but very little. Flavor it had none. Perhaps it required keeping. Even the next day, when all knew what we had done, no one followed our example. We probed all the wounds we could find. Besides that bullet wound through the head and the deep one into the loins, we found one near the right ear and another near the left that went deep into the skull. The balls from the police muskets had only pierced the skin and appeared like the swellings of incipient boils. There was no trace of any former wounds. That night we gave an ample feast, both solid and liquid, perhaps too much of the latter, to our baigas and all our people. Until a very late hour that night, the loud noises of merriment were a strange contrast with the usual quiet and repose of our camp. The next day, the government reward of rupees two hundred offered for the destruction of the elephant was paid to the baigas in attendance, a huge windfall for them, for ordinarily their monthly earnings, when anything at all, are not more than rupees two per month, or about one shilling per week. Some soon spent all, but Bacht and others bought bullocks and started as tillers of the soil, a calling quite new to them, but alas, that is another and long story. The whole of this day was occupied in skinning and cleaning the elephant's head and skinning the body. In the latter there was a serious difficulty. That part which lay upwards was easily managed, but how about that part between the carcass and the ground? Ten times the power at our command would not have been enough to raise that huge mass from the ground. We rolled the skin up close to the carcass, and in vain the tame elephant and about one hundred men pulled at the ropes tied on the upper legs and tried to turn it over. Such was the height of the body that the pull was as hard as possible, and the rigid mass refused to move. At last we devised a series of levers, with long forked pieces of wood in the shape of a leaning W. Passing the ropes over these, we at last succeeded in pulling over the carcass with a crash that threatened to burst it altogether. But even when the skin was altogether separated, it was so thick and heavy that any number of men could not lift it. This skin was so lined with fat that it defied drying and rotted except for tail and feet. We cut it into four pieces and then got it on to the tame elephant. Thus ended the career of what Sir Samuel Baker of African fame told me was the worst rogue elephant he has ever heard of. I certainly think I may claim for him the proud position of being the record monster, whose atrocities have been or will be seldom or ever equaled. Private letters and copious notes written at the time have enabled me now to write this fairly complete narrative. The End <laughs>